Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. And the title of this message is, is, What is a Child of God? What is a Child of God? Now, many people believe that they are a child of God because they come into a church building and sit in a seat. And you think you're a child of God. Or many of you have said, well, we're all God's children. No, we're not. I'm, I, I'm tired to tell you. Maybe I'm the first one to inform you. We're not all God's children. We're all God's creation. But you're only a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, for as many as received him, to them he gave the right power, authority to become children of God, even to them who believe on his name. So you're only a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We're all his creation, but we're not all his children. The amazing thing about children is that they imitate their parents. The good, bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and why is it that they always want to imitate the ugly part of us? But they imitate children. So here it is, we're, we're told... <clears throat> to be imitators of God as dear children. Well, the Greek word for imitate is mimetis. It's where we get mimic from. So we're to mimic God as dear children, as beloved children. But what does that look like? What, what, what does it look like to mimic God? What does that mean? Practically looking at it, you know, if you have repented of your sins and accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a child of God, and so you're to imitate God. What does that mean? What does that look like? How is it that we who are uh, finite beings can imitate an infinite God? So what is it? In what ways can we imitate God? Oh, I believe the very first verse gives us a hint into what that looks like. It says, therefore. Therefore is a word that always takes us back to what was previously said. That means that takes us back into chapter 4. To get the context, we have to look at verse 25. Look what it says there, therefore. Oh, now that takes us further back. In verses 17 to 24, in those particular verses, the Apostle Paul is telling us that we are to put off those things associated with our old man and put on the new man, which was created in Christ Jesus. And remember, we're born again. If we're born again, then there's a new man that we're told to put on. But he told us to put off those things associated with our old life. The Greek word is epotethemi. It's an amazing word. It means to take off, to put away, to lay aside. It's the same Greek word that's used in, 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 in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, when it says lay aside every weight and sin. Lay aside is epotethemi. Same Greek word. It gives the connotation of taking off dirty clothes. To, where at the end of the day, you're going to take off these dirty, well, at least I hope you are. You are. Uh, you're going to take off these dirty clothes and you're going to discard them. You're going to put them in the washing machine, put them in the hamper. You're going to discard them. So there are some things associated with our old life that we're called to discard, that we're called to put off. If we're going to be imitators of God as dear children, there are some things we must put off. And I believe it tells us there. That's where it starts in verse 25. Notice it says, therefore, putting away lying. Notice putting away epothetemi. It's the same Greek word. Put away lying. Notice what's first on the list is lying. Put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So we're told to put away lying. That's first on the list. Lying. The Bible says in Psalm 58, verse 3, that the wicked come forth out of the womb speaking lies. That little cute little baby or grandbaby, you looking in their face. <laughs> They're little liars. <laughs> That's what they are. They're little liars. 
You ask a little Johnny, Johnny, did you eat those cookies? No, I didn't eat those cookies. Crumbs, crumbs all down his mouth. They're little liars. They come forth speaking lies. We come forth out of the womb speaking lies. So this is why lying is first on the list, because God is truth. And therefore, the first thing we must put off is lying. You know, have you noticed how, how easy a lie can just, it just come right on out just like, it's, like it was supposed to come out. And this is why we must put it away. But he tells us why we should put it away, for we're members of one another. I mean, we're, we're part of the body of Christ. So what happens is when you come in here and we say, hey, good to see you. How are you doing? You're like, everything's fine. And everything's not fine. You lie to us. So that means you leave here discouraged. You leave here depressed. You leave here without getting prayer. You leave here the same way you came in because you lied to us. Had you told the truth and said that the sky is falling, I need some prayer. I'm bummed out. I'm discouraged. Then we could have prayed for you. We could have lifted you up and counseled you and spent time just encouraging you in the things of God. But you lied to us. Therefore, you left out of here the same way you came in. This is why we are told to put away lying. You're like, well, you know, don't you go there telling them, telling them folks our business. Let me tell you something, man. Let me let you, man, let me let you in on something. Your business is already out there. She told her sister, her mama, her women's prayer group. I need you to be, you ladies to be praying about something. Your business is already out there, dude. So we're told to speak truth. And that means we have to put away epithetemi. We have to put away lying. In order for us to be imitators of God, we've got to put away lying. Why should we put away lying? Because we're told to be imitators of God as dear children. And when we lie, we're now imitating Satan, who is the father of lies. John 8, 44. Can you imagine that? Here we are supposed to be imitators of God as dear children. We're imitating Satan. That blows me away how easy the switch can happen. It reminds me of Peter. You remember Peter? Oh, Pete, Jesus said he's going to the cross. And first, you know, he says, you know, Jesus told Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And I'm sure old Pete, Pete was like, hey, guys, did y'all hear that? <laughs> the father spoke through me. And then he said, I'm going to the cross. And then old Pete said, stand back, guys, I got, I got this. Far be it from you, Lord. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. The switch can happen so quickly that one minute we can be speaking truth and the next minute we're speaking lies. We're speaking for Satan. This is why we're told the first on the list is to put away lying. And then he says in verse 26, he says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down. So it's something about anger and time. Something needs to happen. As soon as we sense anger has entered our heart, something starts to happen. The, the watch starts ticking. This is why I've always told couples, never, ever go to bed angry. Because something happens. You know what happens? Verse 27, nor give place to the devil. When you allow the sun to go down on your anger, you give Satan place. You know, it's like when somebody, you know, somebody trying to close the door and they put their foot in there, keep the door from closing. 
when you're trying, when you allow the sun to go down, you're closing the door of your day on your anger. And Satan said, oh, no, you're not. I'm going, <laughs> I'm getting in there. <laughs> it's been rightfully said, you give Satan an inch and he'll become your ruler. And what happens is when we allow the sun to go down on our anger, we give Satan place. Place to do what? Well, see, he has some boys. He got some buddies that he likes to travel with. And he likes to bring his boy bitterness. See, here's the thing. When the Bible says, nor give place to the devil, you know that Greek word is diablos? It's where we get slanderer from. When we allow the sun to go down on our anger, on our wrath, watch this, then we become the Diablos. We begin to slander the one we allow the sun to go down on the anger. And you'll slander that husband, and you'll slander that wife, you'll slander that friend, now you have become the Diablos, the slanderer. And when that happens, because now you allow the sun to go down on your anger, and all of a sudden Satan brings his boy bitterness, then bitterness brings his boy hatred, and then here comes the big brother of them all is murder. That's the progression. That's the progression. See, this is why it must be dealt with at the anger stage. Because Jesus made it very clear. He said, you have heard it said of those of old, you shall not murder. But I say, if you're angry with the person, you've murdered them in your heart. So this is why he is saying that he, you, you got to deal with it when it's at the level of anger. You got to deal with it before the time the, the sun goes down. You got to deal with it. And this is what he is saying here. Because you give Satan place, oh, he's coming. He's coming with his boys. See, this is what he was getting after the religious leaders for. He was getting after them because, see, they thought that as long as I was not uh, uh, murdering anyone or committing adultery, hey, I'm, I'm cool. And, and they felt as long as I was outwardly not breaking the commandments, I'm, I'm good. This is why Paul said in Philippians 3, he said, look here, concerning the law, when I was a Pharisee, I was blameless. Because they only looked at the law as that which was external. Jesus is showing them, no, I'm looking at the internal. I'm looking at your heart. And so if you're angry, you murdered them in your heart. If you lust, you committed adultery with them in your heart. See, Jesus is saying, look, I'm going beyond what you're outwardly not doing. I'm looking at the intent in your heart. And this is why he said what he said. And so we're told to put away lying in order for us to be imitators of God. We can't allow the sun to go down on our anger if we want to be imitators of God. And then it says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. Notice, let him who stole, past tense, steal, present tense, no longer. Well, the Greek word for steal is klepto. It's where we get our English word kleptomaniac, a person who can't stop stealing. And, and notice, it's in the present imperative in the Greek language, which means it's a continuous action, meaning that it's still going on. So it, it can be translated, let the, steed, let the thief stop stealing. Oh, we can steal in many ways. <laughs> you know that. Steal means just to take something that doesn't belong to you. You steal in many ways. Hey, did you know if you go to work late, you're supposed to be there 9 o'clock and you're there 9.15, 9.30, you stole 15, 30 minutes from your job. You're a thief. You stole from your job. If, you, if, if lunch is from 12 to 1, you come back 1.30. You stole 30 minutes from your job, and you're a thief. Oh, 
we're not going to talk about how you can steal from God. Hey, let me tell you something. If service starts at 5 and you come and strutting in here at 5.30, 5.40, you stole half an hour, 45 minutes from God. But it's funny, we can be on time for the job, but we willy-nilly come in here late for, for God, for church. And we, we got this thing, God understand grace, brother. <laughs> I give you some grace, all right. I'm a former Marine. You one minute late, UUA. Unauthorized absence, Article 86, you can get money taken away, put in the brig for being one minute late. <clears throat> I'm of the persuasion, if you're on time, you're late. Well, I'm on time. No, you're not, you're late. Oh, we're not going to talk about, we're not going to talk about if, you, if you're not tithing, how you're stealing from God. You're a thief. You're a thief. Oh, you know, the bucket pass, and you pass it every week. <laughs> You're just a thief. You're a little thief, and you know it. Because, see, I know people got money. People got money because, see, I know during this time, many people who normally here are not here because they vacationing. On cruises, baby, let's cruise away from here. And they waving at everybody. Taking selfies. <laughs> People got money. They have money. Oh, we know because in a few months, hey, it's going to be Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And any time that they're putting up figures saying on Black Friday or Cyber Monday that they brought in $46.9 billion, people got money. But we're going to rob God, the one who gave us life, the one, the one who saved us from hell, the one who's given us salvation, the one who allowed the blood to run warm in our veins and eyesight and hearing, and we're going to rob him. But we'll do whatever else we want to do. But that God, the one who wakes us up and breathes in us the breath of life for another day, oh, we're going to rob him. And we're going to say, well, he understands. We respect the IRS more than we respect God. Let some IRS letter come in the mail. And we, <laughs> what, what are we going to do? How are we going to pay? We got to hurry up and pay it. Hurry up and pay this. Then we come in here and say, oh, God understands. Really? But we we'll rob God and it's okay. Mm. I want you to notice it says, let him who stole still no longer but rather let him labor meaning that instead of depending upon stealing to survive you need to labor you need to work notice work in, working with your hands what is good I'm glad that he said that working with his hands what is good because there are people who say you know what I sell drugs but that's not good well, I work the streets, you know, I turn some tricks and I, that's not good. Working with his hands, what is good? I tell our people in Virginia, it might be a little too strong for you California folks. <clears throat> I tell our folks in Virginia, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. And I, t I tell them, I say, ladies, don't put another plate of food in front of him until he gets a job. I say, I guarantee you he'll get a job by this afternoon. <laughs> I said, there's no way on God's green earth I, I will allow my wife to go out every day and my feet curled up, in he, uh, uh, up to heaven. I'm in the bed while she's going out to work some job. There is no way on God's green earth. There is no way. I'm too much a man for that. I'm going to tell you that right now. I get up before she did. I put on a suit and I'll be out there. I don't care if I'm just walking around until the store is open. <laughs> she, she would think I got some Fortune 500 job. I'll be out there walking around till the stores open, beating the pavement. Hey, I don't care. I go flip a burger or something. Something's gonna happen. I'm just too, I'm just too much man for that. I can't allow that to happen. Let him labor, working with his hands, what is good. Not so we can hoard it for ourselves. He says so we can give to those who have need. See, that's the thing. We're most like God when we give. For God so loved the world that he gave. 
He gave. So when we give, uh, at our church, we um, just last year alone, as far as benevolence, we gave like over $20,000 away to people who were in need at our church. So people gave because they labored and they gave because there are people in need. Did you know that this is across the board, worldwide as far as churches? Only 20% of the people who call any particular church their church supports that church financially. Only 20%. Of the other 80% of you, you're just alone for the ride. It's the football field mentality. 22 people on the field doing all the work and 80,000 in the stands cheering. It's the same way. And so that means only 20% of this church supports the rest of you. And see, here's the thing. Watch this. Watch this. And it's the 80% of you that's like... When they go fix this air conditioner, I don't know. When they go get this right, this air, what's wrong with it? Them lights are kind of, hey, well, and it's a, it's a rip in the carpet. What's wrong with it? And you don't give nothing. And you the main one complaining. Fam main one's complaining. You don't give a thing. Y'all all right out there? <laughs> but then he says, because in order for us to be imitators of God, we, got, we have to put away stealing. Then he says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Notice, let no corrupt word. That word corrupt in the Greek is a word that means that which is corrupt, which is stained or spoiled or rotten. It carries the connotation of rotten meat or fruit. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. I am amazed. And how many people who call themselves children of God and they use profanity? I'm, a, I'm stumbled by that. I have a relative who's been walking with the Lord, supposedly, for <laughs> decades. And they just curse. They, they will curse you up one side, down the next. I'm amazed at how many guys call their wives the B word and MF and all that kind of stuff. I'm telling you, are you kidding me? I'm stumbled. If right now, if you call yourself a child of God and you curse, Guess what? I'm stumbled by you. <laughs> I just fail. I'm stumbled by you. Because here's the thing. When I first gave my life to the Lord, I was over in Okinawa, Japan. I was in the Marine Corps. I, I, when I first gave my life to the Lord, the first thing he cleaned up was my mouth. My girlfriend used to say, you have the worst potty mouth. Your mouth is so nasty. Well, now she's been my wife over 30 years, so. <laughs> but she said, your mouth is so nasty. See, here's the thing. Within a week's time, this is just for me, within a week's time, the Lord cleaned up my language. And then when a curse word slipped out, I was like, <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe that came out. Many of you say, oh, well, you know, excuse my French. That was not French. That was English <laughs> and bad English at that. You didn't say wee oui, wee oui, or, or something like that. You know. I, see, when Christ comes into our lives, remember, we always say I accepted Christ in my heart as my Lord and Savior. You remember the Bible said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the tongue goes down into the well of the heart and brings up what's there and spews it out. So just like Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith. So if Christ is in my heart, that means the first thing he's going to clean up is my heart, which will reflect itself in my mouth. 
So that's why when someone is using bad language and, and claiming to be a child of God, I always look at you and just say, the devil is a liar. <laughs> I, I will question what's going on in here in the ticker, in your heart. Because you're, you're not reflect. See, the Bible says in James chapter 3, it says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. These things are not to be so. When you go to the water fountain out in the hallway, does it have a, a, two buttons, one for fresh water, one for bitter? No, it just comes out fresh water. You use profanity, call your wives and children all kind of names and stuff. Then you come in here and, Lord, we lift your name on high. Are you kidding me? You got to be kidding me. That's why the Bible said, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursing. These things are not to be so. So if you want, if you want to be a child of God and call yourself a child of God, you have you have to put these things off. Notice he says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. He says, but what is good for necessary edification? That word edification is a construction word. It means to build up. They, we use that word edification. We don't use that edification, but it means to build up. That means that when you speak words, you should speak words before you allow them to come out. You should say, will this build them up or will it tear them down? Before, well, I just couldn't help it. I just, I just had to give him a piece of my mind. You don't have that much mind to give away. <laughs> what you talking about you don't give somebody a piece of it, like you got a whole bunch up there you can afford to give pieces away. <laughs> and last time I checked, one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. So you're talking about you couldn't help it then I'm going to question your salvation. I'm going to question whether the Lord and the Holy Spirit is in you because the Holy Spirit produces self-control. So it says, what is good for necessary edification? Watch this, that he may impart grace. God's unmerited, undeserved kindness, that he may impart grace to the hearers, that when people hear the words coming out of your mouth, they're gracious words that are coming out of your mouth. The Bible says that when the people heard Jesus, they heard the gracious words. As they're out there in the world, and you guys are out there, you're out there, and you hear profane words, you hear dirty words, you hear condescending words, belittling words, you're hearing all these words, but when people hear us speak, they should hear gracious words coming out of our mouths. The way we talk should be so different that people are like, what is it about you? It's something about you that whenever you talk, I'm just on the edge of my seat. Because they recognize the gracious words. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each person. So in order to be imitators of God, we cannot allow corrupt words to proceed out of our mouths. Then it says, look at there what it says in verse 30. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Greek word is lupel. I know I was just told this afternoon that that sounds like a, uh, you know, a, a Hispanic name. I didn't say lupio. Lupi, you know. No, it's, it's lupel. It, it means to cause pain to. So that's what it means. So what happens is when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we repent of our sin, accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. It's not like in the Old Testament days. In the Old Testament days, when the, when the Holy Spirit would come upon the individual, it would come upon them for a specific task or duty. And when the task was done or they sinned, the Holy Spirit left. This is why David said in Psalm 51, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. For how long? It says to the day of redemption. The day of redemption is the day that our redemption is complete when we get to heaven. So the Holy Spirit is in us. 
to empower us for the work he has for us, but to also empower us to live for him, to empower us to witness for him. And when we sin or when the task, and the task is never done, the Holy Spirit stays. And instead of saying, deuces, I'm out of here, the Holy Spirit is grieved. It caused pain to. So when we lie, when we allow the sun to go down on our anger, when we give place to the devil, when we steal, when we allow corrupt words to proceed out of our mouths, the Holy Spirit is like, ooh, uh, ooh. We cause pain to it. It said the Holy Spirit, we're sealed for the day of redemption, that sealing, it speaks of ownership. It speaks of possession. Masters will have a ring and they will dip it in wax and they will seal their packages. And so when these packages went on the ship and went across the Aegean Sea, the way that they knew that master's package, they knew the seal. It speaks of possession and ownership. And so we repent of our sin and accept Christ. We're sealed. The Holy Spirit seals us but we can grieve the spirit, grieve the spirit, cause pain to the spirit of God. And in order for us to be imitators of God, we have to put grieving the spirit away. Look what he says there in verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I want you to notice, <clears throat> notice what it says. Let all bitterness. Why, why was there a need to say let all bitterness? Because there is some bitterness you're holding on to that you feel that you're justified in holding on to that bitterness. Bitterness is when the sun has gone down on your anger. That's bitterness. And therefore, you feel that you're justified. You don't know. I'm angry. You don't know what he's done to me. He cheated on me. My family, you know, my dad left the family, left my mother, and I'm angry. I'm bitter towards him. He was my partner. He ripped me off. And you feel that that's justified bitterness. Oh, the, the Bible doesn't give us room. If you want to be imitators of God as dear children, then you got to let all bitterness not just some, not just the ones you think is okay to let go. No, let all bitterness. Well, you don't know what they've done from, to me. Let all bitterness. She left me for my best friend. Let all bitterness. They fired me, and I gave 20 years to that company. Let all bitterness. Not some. Not the little ones. You say, oh, I can let that go. No, let all bitterness. Then it says, let all bitterness, wrath. Wrath is the explosion of anger. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. You know what clamor is? Clamor is loud quarreling. You know what you did on the way here? Slow down. You leave me alone, you backseat driver. I can't stand you. I hate you. That's clamor. Loud quarreling. The Bible says we're to put that away too. Notice an evil speaking. That Greek word is where we get our English word blasphemy from. It, to, it, it means to blaspheme someone. It means to harm someone's reputation. You're speaking evil of them for the purpose of harming their reputation. Maybe you're hearing your boss and there was some terrible employee. And all of a sudden they left to take another job and left you hanging. Didn't give the two weeks notice, left you hanging and you just ticked. So all of a sudden, the new job call you up. Well, we got so-and-so put in an application here. What do you think of them? Oh, 
How about take a seat? Sit down. <laughs> Let me tell you about that's that's evil speaking. Maybe someone got a position you thought you should have. And now they got the position. And now you speak evil of them. The purpose of it is to speak evil of them to harm their reputation. Well, if I was given that position, this is how I would have handled the situation. You can't do that. You can't do that. I, I'm in a relationship with so-and-so, and I just saw your number, and I was just wondering if, can you tell me something about, something seems a little odd. Oh, he's dating you now? Oh, let me tell you about him. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. That's evil speaking. The Bible says if you want to be an imitator of God, you got to put that stuff away. And the, then it says, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Malice is that slow burning anger right under the surface. It, if it spills over, that's raft. But it hasn't quite spilled over. It's just right up under there. It's that, that feeling you get when you see that person. And all of a sudden, you turn your head and squint that eye. Ooh. You haven't said anything yet because you say something that's wrapped. It, it's exploding. But you just, ooh. You know that when you put that, 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 that pot on the stove and it hasn't quite started bubbling, boiling yet, but it's just simmering. That's you. In order to be imitators of God, you have to put that away. And then it says in verse 32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgave you. Notice, it said to be kind to one another. We as Christians, we're told to be kind. God is kind. When the kindness and love of God towards man appeared, Titus 3, 4 says, then verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The kindness towards God appeared. God is kind. We should be kind. So often Christians are nasty. Nasty? Just as nasty as you've always been. You're nasty, mean. You're not courteous. You're not kind. People trying to get in, and you speed up on the bumper. And, you, you know, and then they get beside you and look at you, but you don't want to look over at them. And you're just still hugging the bumper, the, neck, the car in front. Let the person in. They got to get in. And we just mean. I, I don't blame you. If I had to drive out here on these freeways all the time, I'd be in the flesh too. I'd be hunking, flashing my lights, hunking horns. Many of you are given half of a peace sign. Yeah. I mean... We, we, we know it's not right, but I, I you know, I almost can't blame it's, it. These roads out here, this kind of, this kind of freeway drive, it's a hot mess. <laughs> Woo! I'm in the flesh and I've only been here a few days. <laughs> bumper to bumper, I was looking, I was, I was telling Pastor David, I said, it's like this on Sunday? Even on Sunday, the traffic is like this? Yeah. So we're told to put these things off. We need to be kind, kind. Then it says tenderhearted. It's the opposite of hardhearted. There are a lot of things out there that's going on in the world today that can harden our hearts. But we're told that we should be tenderhearted. We should have hearts like God, that, that we, the things that are, that are, Hardening the hearts of the people out there should be breaking our hearts. Oh, we sing the song, Lord, break our hearts. Well, what breaks yours? That, that means our heart will remain tender. Instead of us, you know, getting mad and pounding, our hearts should be breaking. And say, wow. That's how you, you keep your heart tender by being in the presence of the one who can tenderize it. 
and that's God. And we, you, we got to keep our hearts tender. Oh, here's the big one. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Oh, boy. <sighs> what, what I love about this is God doesn't leave us room to forgive in the way that we think we should forgive. Your way of forgiving is, I will forgive you, but I won't forget. And you dangle it over their head every chance you get. Honey, what are you talking about? I haven't done that. Oh, yes, you did. You did it two weeks ago, and it was on a Sunday, and you were wearing blue. <laughs> You're like, well, I thought love keeps no record of wrong. I thought that's what 1 Corinthians 13. I don't know that verse. Like, what's up with that? Forgiving, notice it says, forgiving one another. Then it tells us how. Even as God in Christ forgave you. That's how you would forgive. You know, the true definition of forgiveness is to treat the individual as if the offense never occurred. That's true forgiveness. And that's where we all say, Lord, help me. Because, see, we cannot erase the memory. We wish we could. But he says, forgive us. See, show me a person that's holding on to unforgiveness, and I'll show you a person that doesn't realize or has forgotten how much they have been forgiven. Oh, Jesus told a story. Jesus told a story in Matthew chapter 18. When I was teaching through Matthew 18, I entitled this message, message, The Prison of Unforgiveness. And Jesus told a story about a man who owed some ridiculous amount of money, $16 million or so. And the guy came before the king, and at that time, if you didn't pay, you went into debtor's prison. So he said, you know, pay me what you owe. And the guy said, oh, Lord, no, I can't pay you. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Have mercy. I'm throwing you in the debt. Oh, no, please don't. And the king looked at him and said, I forgive you. And he probably got up and said, yes. All right. So he went out, and he saw a guy who owed him a few bucks. He was like, oh, no, dude, dude, don't run. Don't run. Come on back here, man. You owe, you, you, you owe me. Pay me what you owe. And the guy fell on the ground, begged, oh, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Now, that should have triggered something for him. That should have triggered and said, I just did that. But he grabbed him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe. The guy said, I, I, don't, I don't have it. And he threw him and his family into debtor's prison. Now, keep in mind, while all this was going on, somebody was watching. <laughs> and they went back and told the king. Said, king, man, you were, <laughs> we just saw something I know is going to blow your mind. King, king, did, you know, there, you remember that guy that was just in here? You know, the one that was crying, you know, you know snot was coming right down. He was just crying. And King, yeah, I remember the guy. He said, well, we just saw him. He, we just saw him grab this guy who owed him a few dollars. And I'm sure the king probably said, and he forgave him, right? Then, no, king, you should have seen him. He grabbed him by the throat and threw him into prison. And so the king called that man back and said, Please tell me it isn't true what I just heard. He said, did you not forgive them? I forgave you of this great debt. And you couldn't forgive this man a few dollars? And the king said, deliver him to the torturers. And then Jesus said, Jesus, Jesus. And so too my heavenly father would do to each of you if each of you from his heart would not forgive his fellow man. And there are many of you who are in the prison of unforgiveness. You're tortured by the unforgiveness. 
See, you think in holding on to the unforgiveness that it's going to somehow hurt the one you hold in the unforgiveness towards and it doesn't even touch them. That makes you even angrier. That ticks you off even more because you want them to hurt like you're hurting and they're going on with their life. There was a guy who used to attend our church and he moved away chasing after his wife. Wife is trying to get away from him and she, he, she took a job out of the state, and he went after her, chasing her. So two years later, I get a phone call. Ring, ring. I said, hello? Pastor Tony? I said, I said, Vic, is this you? Yeah, this is, this is Vic. Uh, I just want to let you know that I've been holding unforgiveness towards you for two years. I said, Vic, why would you do that? I've gone on with my life. He was tortured by the unforgiveness, in the prison of unforgiveness. And he was angry with me over something. I'm going on with ministry, with life. And so too is that person you holding that unforgiveness toward. They go on with their life. They're not caring about which, how you feeling. Maybe if you, if you talk to them, they might care. And they say, why, would, why didn't you come and talk to me? But see, all the time, you were tortured by it. See, watch this. Jesus came to set the captives free. He says, whom the son sets free is free indeed, John 8, 36. So Jesus has the keys to death and hell, and Jesus unlocked the cage and set the, uh, opened the prison doors to set the captives free. Okay, he's done that. Watch this. For those of you who are holding unforgiveness, you have decided to walk around in the cell. The door is open now. <laughs> You're making things nice and tidy. You know, you just, you know, you're just walking around and just, the door is open. But you want to walk around in the prison of unforgiveness and wonder why you're tortured by it. Your walk would not go on with the Lord as long as you're holding on to that. It would not, it would not continue. And see, what happens is, you think, you think, well, I'm not, I'm not growing anymore. So watch this, watch this. This is classic California right here. Watch this. I'm not growing anymore. So what I need to do, I need to change churches. And you like some Mexican jumping beans popping around to this church, this church, boom, 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 boom. I'm over here, boop, 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 boop. And I always tell folks in Virginia, wherever you go, there you are. You the problem. It's not the church. It's you. I tell folks all the time, look in the mirror. It's not the church. You know you're getting fed the word of God. The word of God is going forth here. So it's not here. It's you. It's 9 out of 10. You're holding on to unforgiveness. You're holding on to all that kind of stuff. And you're going to blame it on the church. So let me bounce over here. And then you're going to get over there and you go, oh, no, no, that's not it. Let me bounce over here. And you're going to be boom, da boom, da boom, boom, boom. That's so typical California out here. <laughs> typical. You want to bounce from our church? Yeah, you bounce. You ain't going to go to another Calvary Chapel, I can tell you that, unless you're going to drive some serious miles. <laughs> Out here, pff, there'd be 10 Calvary Chapels in a five-mile radius. You kidding me? Some mess. Everybody's called to pastor. Oh, I'm called to be a pastor. Where? Southern California. I bet you are. You can open up a garage door and put a Calvary Chapel and have an instant congregation. <laughs> it's so California. But it's because you're holding on to the unforgiveness. My wife already told me my time is up. So, <laughs> so it says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And this is why it says in chapter 5, verse 1, therefore... Be imitators of God as dear children. You remember I said we're most like God when we give? Well, we're really most like God when we forgive. 
and that's what we need to see. I believe that there are some people in your life that you need to forgive and let it go. Let me encourage you to say, let it go. Let it go. You don't know, let it go. You don't realize, let it go. Let it go. It's eating you up. You're tortured by it. Like Jesus said, so too my heavenly father would do to each of you if each of you from his heart doesn't forgive. You're tortured. Let it go. He loved you too much. There's too much work and ministry to be done for you to be sitting in your prison of unforgiveness. It's too much to be done. Too many neighbors and thousands of folks to reach. Even though, you know, many of these Calvary chapels are in the tens of thousands. But guess what? I heard that there was around seven to eight million people in the Orange County and all this whole area. Seven, eight million. You got a few Calvaries that's ten thousand or more that shows that there's a whole lot of folks that's still not being reached and God can use you he can't use me let me tell you something let me let me close with this story around five years ago I I, I went through some stuff some mess had to you know let some guys go and just all kind of mess and they tried to destroy the church to get to me Three, seven hundred people left. It was a mess. And I was ticked. I was bitter. I, I outwardly, I handled it the right way. But inside, I was dying. I was angry. And what happens is, you know how a jail cell, jail cell has, you know, you can, you can see and talk through the, the poles there. And I was in my prison of unforgiveness. I still had to pastor. I still had to teach. And I was teaching from my prison cell. And, and, and the messages I was given verse by verse was verse by verse, but it was mixed and mingled with anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. And there was a new guy who came on staff. He gave me a book a year earlier, and I wasn't ready to read it then. But finally, a year later, I read the book. And the intro, the intro, I didn't say the book. The intro rocked my world so hard, I had to put that book down and just look at it and say, whoa. What did I just read? And I went on and read the book, Set Me Free. The book is Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. You know why I said it three times? Because I know there's somebody going to say, what's the name of that book? I'm not saying it anymore. <laughs> I'm done. If you didn't get it, you didn't get it. Ask your neighbor. Maybe they got it. I, I, you know, I'm not saying it anymore. Pastor, wasn't it? No. I said it three times up there. Oh. I went one more than the Lord. Did the Lord to do it, you know, twice. Abraham, Abraham, Saul, Saul, Samuel, Samuel, Martha, Martha. He gave it to you twice. I gave it three Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I gave you three. I was trying to be spiritual. So don't ask me what that book is. But that book changed my world. Rocked my world. And I was able to forgive. I was able to let go. I was able to forgive to the point where I went to restore the relationships with all those guys. And to this day, relationships have been restored. Because I could not pastor effectively holding unforgiveness. If I want to be an imitator of God as dear children, I, I had to forgive. And I was able to do it because of that. Let me wrap it up with this. In order for us to be imitators of God as dear children, we're told we have to put off lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then this tells us we'll put away anger. Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Number three, nor give place to the devil. We've got to put that off. Then number four, let him who stole steal no longer, but let him labor, working with his hands, and he may give those who have need. 
Then we're told in verse 29, he says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, they may minister grace to the hearers. We've got to put that mess off. And then it says, be, you know, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in verse 30, by whom you're sealed to the day of redemption. And then it says, let all bitterness and anger and wrath and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And then it tells us in verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And then it says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. May we imitate God as dear children. And if we're going to be imitators of God, it means more than coming and sitting in a seat in church. It means putting off some things associated with our old life. And all those things is what we used to do. And it can't be what we still do. Because we're told we've been born again. And that means something. That means there's a new way of talking, new way of walking, new way of doing things, new way of speaking. That's what it means. And may God help us to be imitators of God as dear children.